Hi, this is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to give you simple, easy to understand strategies, insights and tips to help you master the game of building wealth. And in this episode, I'd like to talk about why investing is often more a game of lending than it is actually investing in assets. Um, Let me start with a quote from author and property investor Michael Yardney, who runs a buyer's agent, national buyer's agent business called Metropole. Um, They do do property management and a bunch of other things. Um, In one of his articles to which I have a link in the show notes, he says, and I quote, real estate is a game of finance with some houses thrown in the middle. So what does Michael uh, mean in respect to that comment? Well, the thing is that people think the scarce resource is investment grade property. And it is to some extent, particularly in uh, context of all property in Australia, investment grade property only makes up a very small percentage, less than 5% of all property in Australia would be regarded as investment grade property. But really the scarce resource is borrowing capacity because everyone has a limit to how much they can and should borrow. Uh, And it's really then the allocation of that scarce resource, borrowing capacity, that's the most important thing to get right. In a normal market, investors that are well advised by a professional buyer's agent will eventually be able to identify and acquire a quality investment grade property asset. Um, And if you had uh, theoretically an unlimited borrowing capacity or unlimited amount of money, you could theoretically keep buying investment grade properties and you could buy quite a number within a, a relatively short space of time. However, the reality is that most people, or all people I should say, have a uh, limited amount of borrowing capacity. So you really need to do two things uh, in respect to this. The first one is that you need to allocate that scarce resource as efficiently and as effectively as possible. But secondly, you need to maximise that scarce resource within obviously reasonable safe limits. Let me share a recent experience, a personal experience with you um, to really illustrate this uh, point. My wife and I just recently refinanced some loans from Westpac to ANZ. Most of these loans were set up in the last three to five years. And in fact, one was established as a result of an unexpected but advantageous property acquisition late in 2016. To get the loan approved, however... Um, and I broke one of my golden rules I I purchased without having a a pre-approval in place, Um, but I was relatively confident of getting the finance approved, and it was an acquisition that had to be made in a very short space of time uh, because of the opportunity that uh, arose. In any case, to get the loan approved, we had to agree to making accelerated principal repayments. That is, we were making um, principal interest repayments that were quite significant to pay down the loan. Now, that was fine to agree to in 2016, but really over the past three or four years, our loan-to-value ratio has reduced significantly because we've been paying down debt, but also, most importantly, the property values have increased and we've um, renovated some properties as well. Uh, And our overall financial position in terms of income, assets, liabilities and so forth has materially strengthened. Um, So I thought I'd go back to Westpac and ask them to do two things. Restructure our loans to move most of them to interest only and also access some equity given the property values had increased uh, increased quite significantly. Uh, I started that process back in September last year, September 2019. In short, the answer was no. They they said no. Now, whilst that was really frustrating and, and frankly nonsensical, Um, it reminded me how important it is to know the rules of the game. And you really need to know when to push and when to walk away. And most importantly, you need to know, is no really no? Or maybe no means you're either not talking to the right person in the bank or you're not talking to the right bank. The short story is that we refinanced to ANZ. We attained a lower interest rate. Almost all debt is on interest only. We only elected, we elected to have one on principal interest, not the bank. Uh, and we obtained access to a, a large amount of equity as well. And that refinance only settled a couple of weeks ago. Now, if I, I if I had a state at Westpac, I would have been banging my head against the wall. Uh, I probably wouldn't be any closer today to restructuring that debt um, than I am. Uh, and so it's important to know, you know, how to play those rules of the game, uh, rules of lending game to your advantage to make sure that you're 
um, going to be able to move your personal financial situation forward. So I've always counseled my clients to do two things. The first one is always borrow more than you need, more than you think you need. You know, that is include really large buffers or as large a buffers as possible, even if you think there's no um, need for the money. And then secondly, the best time to borrow is when you actually don't really need to borrow. You know, when there's no sense of urgency, when there's no importance, when there's no financial stress and so forth. Now, when I started talking to Westpac back in September 19, um, in regards to restructuring and lending and accessing equity, I had no immediate plans for further borrowings. I didn't really, I knew I wanted to access the equity because I want to lock it in. But I, at that point in time, I had no um, reason for wanting those monies or wanting to use those monies. As it happened, you know, the refinance only settled two weeks ago and now I've got access to a substantial sum of money and markets have fallen and maybe there'll be some good buying opportunities in the property market also. So um, it, that that has reinforced, you know, my uh, personally reinforced the advice that I've been giving to clients that is always proactively manage your borrowable equity. And that's really important to be able to do uh, in order to execute on your investment plans. But of course, to be able to do that, I mean, much like uh, playing Monopoly, you know, you need to first learn the rules of the game and then you secondly need to work out how to play them to your advantage. And um, I play Monopoly with my two, uh, with my wife and, and two 13-year-old sons relatively regularly and it's really interesting to see them. They know the rules of the game, but then now they have to really work out how to how to play them to their advantage and unfortunately their father never lets them win uh always uh, play hard and play to win but that's the best way for them to learn right uh anyway that's what i tell myself uh but winning in the game of lending is no difference you need to understand the rules and there's really two types of rules in my view the first one is prudential lending standards that's credit policy now, some credit policy is hard and fast and will never be changed and doesn't matter you either tick the box or you don't other credit policy can be changed. So a hard and fast rule, typically, I mean, there's a couple lenders that will lend 85% of a property's value without mortgage insurance, but the vast majority of banks out there will lend up to 80% of a property's value. Now, if you're trying to apply for a loan for 81%, typically, most lenders, forget about it. It doesn't matter. It needs to be 80%. You're not going to move the rule. You just need to play your game assuming that rule is hard and fast. There are some credit policy, of course, that is a little bit more subjective. And if you can demonstrate that they're mitigating factors, that you can sometimes bend those rules and move around them. Again, you need to know when to do that, when that's possible and when that's not possible. But also there's a, a bunch of unwritten rules as well that you typically only learn through experience. So, for example, referring back to my Westpac refinance story that I just told you, um, the problem that I had was that in 2016, when we purchased, when we acquired that uh, property, and the credit manager said, yes, we'll give you the money, but you need to make accelerated re loan repayments, the bank took a stance at that point in time. Now, for someone to come back, for a credit manager to come back today, albeit four years later, nearly four years later, the credit manager today has to overturn the decision that the credit manager made back in um, 2016. So um, uh, that, that's a bold move, right? Even though they might have all the things to point to to justify making that decision, a credit manager is not going to put their bonus and potentially also their job on the line because it all turns pear-shaped. Um, their managers are going to come back and say, look, why did you overturn it? This is our view and so forth. And particularly because of the Royal Commission and all the tightening and regulation and so forth, there's a lot more oversight, probably, well, it's definitely too much uh, oversight uh, over credit managers at the moment. And they really don't have enough latitude, in my view, to be able to um, uh, execute a, a reasonable risk assessment when looking at an application. So if you want to keep your job, the best thing to do is just not stick your neck out and not approve and not overturn a decision. Now, that's, the, that's what was working behind the scenes. So it doesn't really, at, at Westpac, in my view, this is my reading of it. So it doesn't matter, you know, I could have kept, provi kept providing evidence uh, and more and more evidence to demonstrate the creditworthiness of my application, but we just don't have, didn't have any, anyone within the bank that was willing to stick their neck out. Another example uh, is bank valuations. 
it's almost near impossible to get a valuer to change their report after they've submitted it to the bank, even if you present new evidence. If a valuer says, look, the property's worth 800 grand and you think it's worth 900, you've got to essentially get your the valuer to either confirm they were wrong or they initially did a poor job. Either way, given egos at work, you're just not going to do it. The, the simplest and quickest way then is to just move to a, a different bank. Get a fresh pair of eyes, exactly what I did with ANZ, and you'll get a more reasonable uh, assessment of your application. So in order to, uh, so as I said, you need to know the rules of the game and lending game, and then you need to play them to your advantage. So how do you play them to your advantage? Well, I think there's three things that you need to do in order to um, win at the, the game of lending. And remember, the game of lending is really to maximise your personal borrowing capacity within a safe limits. I'm not saying go out and borrow as much as you can possibly borrow. Of course, that would be stupid. You first need to um, uh, develop your own assessment of what uh, is prudent to borrow. And then it's about going out and proactively managing your borrowing capacity so that you're able to execute that. So here's the, th the three things I need to think that I think you need to do in order of importance um, that you need to do well to win at the game of lending. The first one is maximise your borrowable equity. And in practice, that usually means restructuring lending every, say, one to five years, depending on your circumstances. Now, sometimes you can do that with your existing bank. Other times you need to move bank. You shouldn't be too concerned about um, wh whether that requires a, a move, a switch, a refinance, or whether you stay with your existing bank. All you need to be really worrying about, in my opinion, is that you're able to maximise your borrowable equity. And of course, you need to do it safely. You're not overextending yourself um, and make sure you've got enough buffers and, and income and, and so forth. The second thing is you need to make sure your borrowings are tax effective. And that includes things like um, making sure your loans are structured correctly, using offsets, not mixing loan purposes, all those sorts of things. At the end of the day, um, investment debt is, the interest charged in respect to investment debt is going to be tax deductible, and that is a significant tax deduction over the life of your investment. So you should never compromise that, and you should make sure it's optimised. Uh, and thirdly, minimise interest and fees, so the cost of debt. It's an obvious one. However, I find that most investors tend to unduly focus on, the, uh, on just that step at the expense of the other two. That is, they just look at rates and fees and forget about maximising their borrowable equity. Remember, if you can safely uh, find a way to borrow more money, which allows you to buy another asset or another property or invest more in the share market, and assuming you do that prudently and you invest in quality assets, at the end of the day, in the long run, it's going to make you help you build more personal wealth. And that would be particularly true in a very low interest rate environment. Okay, so the rules have changed a lot over the years. You know, I remember when I started ProSolution back in 2002, uh, lending was ridiculously easy. You know, you essentially just approach the bank, nominated a loan amount, you'd receive the loan documents within a few days, bang, the loan's all set up. And then sometimes you'd receive a call from the bank and say, oh, hey, Stuart, we better get a loan application form signed by the client and maybe send me a couple of pay slips. I just need to, um, you know, fill the fill the file and complete the, complete the, the compliance obligations. It was all very loose um, and it was uh, too open uh, to be abused by, by many. Um, and of course, it was absolutely irresponsible too. And so things needed to be tightened up. But as I've said many times, it's certainly gone uh, almost completely in the other direction and, and probably gone too far. My recent experience in terms of refinancing from Westpac to ANZ was a, a major eye-opener. You know, I'm pretty organised. Well, I'd say I'm very organised. I certainly know what's required. You know, I certainly know how to present the information. But the, the volume of information and questions, even though things were nice and simple uh, and well presented, uh, was, was eye-opening. So certainly things have changed, but there's no point complaining about it. You just have to play the game. You've got to provide the information. You've got to answer the questions. You've got to jump through the hoops. Uh, if you want to maximise your borrowing capacity. And as I said, it puts you in a better position like I, I never expected 
uh, in March 2020 that, you know, I'd like to access some equity to invest or, and so forth. Um, okay, so that leads me into talking about my next book, uh, Rules of the Lending Game, which is exactly why I've written the book, to help you learn the rules and help you play them to your advantage, particularly since they have changed significantly over the last couple of years. And I'm really happy to be able to uh, offer it for sale uh, starting today. Uh, and you can buy it through uh, our website in hard copy. Uh, the soft copy, uh, so you know, sort of Kindle and Apple version of the book should be ready in the next week or so. But we, you know, depending on what's going on and how many people are still working, that that's a little bit uh, loose. It'll be in bookstores uh, in April. Uh, it's just being sent out at the moment to bookstores, so you can certainly get uh, some early copies uh, by buying through us. Um, and also, I've included in the book, one of the chapters is a chapter summary, which is a dot point um, summary of each of the key points that I cover in each chapter. And it will give you a really good sense of what the book covers. And also, it'd be a very valuable uh, resource tool for you to keep coming back to uh, throughout your investing life. Um, I have provided a link in the show notes and the blog on the website, and you can download that full chapter summary uh, it's about 12 pages, so it'll give you a very comprehensive overview of of uh, what the book covers, but most importantly, a great resource tool in the future. And feel free to, to obviously share that document with family and friends as well. And since we're all being told to stay at home and locked away in our houses uh, under quarantine for the next few weeks, it could be a wonderful opportunity to carve out some time and um, digest the book and, and uh, upskill on this uh, very important uh, subject. Uh, so uh, there will be, there are uh, links in the show notes to the podcast and also the blog on the website. Uh, just click on that, uh, buy your copy, and uh, we will make sure they're put in the post as soon as uh, possible so you can start reading that. Uh, so there you go. Uh, I hope you enjoy the podcast and the book. And if you do, please share with others. Uh, but until next week, bye for now.